Ok, allora no, la notizia straordinaria di oggi è che eh, abbiamo scoperto, abbiamo la certezza, le prove che eh, a Dio piace la MMT. Perché, no, e abbiamo le prove perché dobbiamo raccontare ai nostri eh, economisti che fino a pochi giorni fa in Italia c'era un metro di neve che avrebbe impedito... Snow in questa area che avrebbe impedito il 75% delle persone di venire qui. Whereas with the summit we had uh, 18 degrees Celsius, now the uh, summit is ending and God pushes the button and the bad weather is back. So God is an mmt -er. Now very briefly, uh, let me say, well, something that is uh, causing a bit of a problem. I very much appreciate Mr. Galloni. I'm not his friend or his supporters, but he is a man who, a brave man, and who deserves to be listened. And I very much support plurality of opinions, pluralism, and of um, opinions, basically, and thought. And uh, MMTs and circuit theories are not a close parish as the ones we have in Italy. You have to get information wherever you can take it from. This is an, our proposal for Galloni. I know that there are um, people who want, it, uh, or want uh, him to, to talk again, but it's not possible because he has already spoken yesterday. And he's, he lives in Italy, uh, so we perhaps will have him um, on another opportunity. Now we have people coming from abroad who haven't slept for eight, 48 hours. So uh, really I think we should give uh, time to our foreign colleagues and friends today. And then, this is a difficult country to live in. Just imagine the type of mafia-like organization was required in Italy to conceal from all media this event. It's like uh, concealing a Tyrannosaurus Rex in a pub. I mean, this is very difficult, but they were able to do it. Another important thing, I said on the first day, and I'm repeating this, we are not abandoning you. We will try and build uh, with the scientific uh, rigor, with uh, uh, their help and with uh, Mr. Parge's help as well, and we will put it on the website www.democraziamt.info uh, and we will built from there. There is another important point. Alain Parguez uh, mentioned uh, a few politicians who uh, are uh, compromised, as it were, with Italian politicians, in particular Marzimo D'Alena. I was asked to expand on this. This is not possible today, but Alain Parge is uh, morally uh, a, let's say, renowned. Uh, so he, you can contact him for further details, but uh, we can't really go into this today because we've got other things to discuss. Then let me thank the people from security who really were real professionals, so thank you very much for their cooperation. The translators. Thank you. And also these uh, guys from PMP who are really the ones who were in charge of all the technical arrangements and uh, sounds etc. And now we'll have the grand finale. We start with Marshall Auerbach who will give us 20-25 minutes of a presentation to uh, conclude as it were Kelton's uh, speech. We have sort of had a world record because Stephanie Kelton is a war machine. But nevertheless, we destroyed her. What did he say?
after a war machine that ah. he's destroyed here. Ah. <laughs> and now, Marshal Auerbach. And then the questions. If you don't have your uh, written uh, questions uh, or your written question is not asked, I'm really sorry, but we have to conclude by a certain hour in the afternoon. Okay, thank you. I will try to elaborate on one or two themes that uh, Stephanie Kelton discussed this morning. I've chosen uh, two which I think are very crucial to help you. Uh, one is the analogy of the government as the house of the family and the other thing I'd like to raise again is the issue of the user, the issue of currency which I obviously is the issue of currency which obviously is very relevant as far as the European Monetary Union goes. So I'm going to start with the question about, is government like a household? Now, discussions of government budget deficits here and also in America and virtually anywhere always start with an analogy to the household budget. We always hear, no household can spend more than its income and neither can the federal government. Now, on the surface, that sounds very sensible. But if you look a little bit more closely, it makes no sense at all. A sovereign government, such as what you have in the United States, Australia, Japan, Canada, bears no resemblance to a household. So let's get into the specific differences. First of all, the American US federal government is over 220 years old, if we date the birth to the adoption of its constitution. That's probably as good a date as we can find since the uh, constitution, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, established uh, a common market in the US. Um, it forbid states from interfering with interstate trade and gave the federal government power to levy and collect taxes. Okay, so w the government is 221 years old. I know people in this country are very healthy, but no head of household can live for 221 years. Now, this might appear irrelevant, but it's not. When you die, your debts and assets need to be assumed and resolved. And likewise with companies. They can be long-lived, but when they go out of business or are acquired, the debts are resolved or assumed by the new party. There's no quote-unquote day of reckoning, no final piper paying date for the sovereign government, by contrast. Now it's true that not all governments last forever, and sometimes a new government will choose to honor the debts of the deceased government. But this is a choice. This is a choice because a sovereign government is sovereign. In spite of all the analogies drawn between governments and households with statements that debts could not be allowed to grow forever, corporations that are going concerns can and do allow their outstanding debt to grow year after year with no retirement of final debt unless the firm goes out of business. The key, of course, is that they attempt to balance their current account and keep a separate capital account. So long as they can service their debt, it can always be rolled over. And that's why some deficit dubs advocate capital accounts for governments. But of course, if a business cannot service its debt, it can't create currency and therefore can go out of business. To that extent, a debt can become unsustainable. Now, if we look at households, 
Households do not have the power to levy taxes. Households are users of the currency issued by the sovereign government. The same as distinction that applies to private firms, which are also users of the currency. Both households and firms do issue liabilities, and some of these can function to varying degrees as quote-unquote money. For example, a bank issues demand deposits, which are the bank's liability, and can be used by households or other firms as money functioning as a medium of exchange or means of debt retirement or store of value. However, all of these private money things are denominated in the dollar. And only the sovereign government of the United States has the constitutionally mandated right to fix standards of weight and measurement to name the unit of account. Now, it's clear that individuals in the US can voluntarily choose to use foreign currencies, such as the euro, or even can barter. But when all is said and done, the ability of the US government to impose dollar taxes and other obligations, such as fees and fines, and to require that these taxes and obligations are actually paid in dollars, gives priority use to dollars within its sovereign territories that no other currency enjoys. Now, as far as debt itself, public debt, because in many instances, people tend to conflate debt, private and public. The federal government in the United States has been in debt almost every single year since its founding in 1776. If you listen to some economists, their ideal world would be that the U.S. starts to pay down all of its debt and runs budget surpluses forever. Well, let's look at an actual historical example of what actually happened when that occurred. In January 1835, for the first and only time in its history, U.S. public debt was completely retired. Completely. And a budget surplus was maintained for the next two years in order to accumulate what Treasury Secretary Levi Woodbury called, quote, a fund to meet future deficits. Well, the result was pretty predictable. In 1837, the economy collapsed into a deep depression that drove the budget into deficit, and the federal government has been in debt ever since. Since 1776, there have been exactly seven periods of substantial budget surpluses and substantial reductions of the debt. From 1817 to 1821, the national debt fell by 29 percent. I've lost my And from 1823 to 1836, it was eliminated thanks to President Jackson's efforts. From 1852 to 1857, it fell by 59%. From 1867 to 1873, it fell by 27%. And from 1880 to 1893, by more than 50%. From 1920 to 1930, it fell by about a third. Of course, the last time we ran a budget surplus in the United States was during the Clinton years, and that was considered a wonderful achievement. Now, has any household been able to run budget deficits for approximately 190 years out of the past 230? And has any household been able to accumulate debt virtually nonstop since 1837? No is the obvious answer. Now, by no coincidence, the United States has also experienced six periods of depression that began in 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1893, and 1929. So far, 
every single significant reduction of outstanding debt, with the exception of the Clinton surpluses, has been followed by a depression. And every depression has been preceded by significant debt reduction. Now, we didn't have a depression following the Clinton surplus, but we did have a recession. And we also had a huge speculative private debt-fueled euphoria and then the collapse in which we now find ourselves. Now, we can play around with words and say, well, we haven't really suffered a depression yet, but we've certainly suffered a financial crisis as serious as anything we've experienced since the Great Depression. Even when we've had recessions in the United States in the post-war period, they have almost always been preceded by significant reductions of federal budget deficits. So the other important point to note is that the federal government, as I said before, is the sole issuer of our currency. And the dollar, in fact, is nothing more than the government's IOU. And it's always accepted in payment. And as Stephanie mentioned before, the government spends by crediting the bank deposits and crediting the reserves of those banks. Point is that no household or firm is able to spend simply by crediting bank deposits and reserves or by issuing currency. Households and firms can spend by going into debt, but the debt must be serviced with the debt of another, usually a bank debt. Sovereign governments, by contrast, only make payments, including interest payments on its debt, by issuing its own IOU. That's why the notion that this is quote-unquote Ponzi finance does not apply to the government, because unlike private debtors, it can always service its debt by issuing more of its debt. So when you hear about unsustainable deficits or Ponzi finance, this is totally inapplicable to a sovereign government. Now, I realize that making this kind of distinction between a sovereign government and a household will not put to rest all deficit fears. But I think it's important to address it because the analogy is invoked constantly in our country. And I think it's very important that you understand the differences completely so that you can combat that when it's being talked about. When a speaker claims that budget deficits are unsustainable, the government must eventually pay back all that debt, ask him why the US government has managed to avoid retiring debt since 1837. Is 173 years a long enough time to establish a sustainable pattern? Perhaps we can go on another 173 years without the government going bankrupt, even though it will run deficits most of those years. Now that's how it works with a sovereign government. Clearly, as we've discussed over these last two days, that is not what applies here in the Eurozone. Now, most of the attention over the last few years has focused on Greece, which is a country that has been unfairly demonized for its quote-unquote fiscal responsibility. It's also cooked its books. It's massed its debt and debt levels with the help of uh, the likes of Goldman Sachs. Uh, it has... <laughs> It has a huge budget deficit, but it has been trying to cut it over the last several years and has had some success, but at a cost of deflating the economy into the ground. Its bonds have been downgraded by the ratings agencies. Now, in my country, to intensify the deficit scare, deficit hawks have used Greece as an example of what awaits us if the U.S. doesn't tighten its fiscal belt. By doing this, of course, they failed to make the much-needed distinction that we've been making here between a non-sovereign country like Greece and a sovereign one like the U.S. It's fair to say that countries like Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain, even Germany, ultimately do face a solvency issue. But using these countries as analogs to the U.S. is the result of failure of deficit critics to understand the difference between monetary arrangements of sovereign and non-sovereign governments.
You've probably heard of the book, this time it's different, by Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt. They make the claim that when deficits, public deficits, are in excess of 90% of GDP, that invariably growth begins to slow down. But of course, they make no distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign issuers, and they make little distinction between public and private debt. Eurozone countries have faced two kinds of constraints by entering the Euro regime. First, as we've already discussed, they gave up their fiscal sovereignty by giving up their national currencies and adopting a supranational one, the Euro. And by divorcing their fiscal and monetary authorities, they have relinquished their public sector's capacity to provide high levels of employment and output. Non-sovereign countries are limited in their ability to spend by taxation and bond revenues, and this applies, as I said before, to every single country in the European Monetary Union. Giulio Tramonti himself has said that the country, that the European Monetary Union is like the Titanic. They're all, you're all on the same boat. Germany may occupy the first class carriage and maybe the Irish are in third class, but you are all in the Titanic. And when the Titanic hits the iceberg, the entire ship goes down. Second, by entering the Eurozone, all of you have arbitrarily agreed to abide by the Maastricht Treaty, which restricts your budget deficits to only 3% of GDP and your debt, overall public debt, to 60% of GDP. So even if you are able to borrow and finance your deficit spending, you're not supposed to be using fiscal policy above these limits. So as I said before, Countries have reused, resorted to different means to keep their national economies afloat. They have tried to foster the export sector, as Germany does, to cooking uh, the books, as Greece has done, Spain has done it, and Italy has done it. The constraints have proved somewhat flexible, but that does not mean they don't matter. They clearly do. In theory, when a nation exceeds its mandated limits, it can face punishment by European institutions and also by markets. We've seen the punishing impact already from markets. There is a competition amongst the Eurozone nations for ratings from the bond markets. Germany usually wins, which allows it to issue Euro debt at a much lower interest rate than, say, Spain, or Portugal or Greece. That in turn keeps its interest spending lower and its deficits are lower in a nice virtuous cycle. And by contrast, you have countries like Greece, which are being punished with high interest rates that drive them into a vicious death spiral because deficits rise, which leads to further debt credit downgrades and then the markets go off to pick off the next weakest member. So now that we've finished with Greece, the likelihood is that Portugal is next. And as we know, as we've seen over the last few days, because we continue to misdiagnose the illness, we provide the wrong sort of remedy. We continue to say that fiscal profligacy is the problem and that what governments need to do is tighten their belts. But it's impossible to tighten your belt, as you can see, in the middle of a recession. Your economy continues to collapse. Your tax revenues collapse. Your social welfare expenditures go up. And the deficits increase. It's like a dog chasing its own tail. Now, as we've discussed, there are solutions for Greece and the rest of the Euro area. First, as we outlined this morning, this is not without complication, but they can exit the Eurozone, regain monetary sovereignty, and run budget deficits large enough to achieve full employment. They will likely need to default on their Euro-denominated debt, 
because it could become even more difficult to obtain euros to service it, especially if trade sanctions are slapped on the levers. The trade-off, of course, is that the individual nations would regain control of their domestic policy space and be able to spend like the U.S. does. If you remember Stephanie's graph, the triangle would be much bigger. This would relieve sovereign governments of the necessity of begging at the mercy of the bond markets, the ratings agencies, and allow them to keep their labor resources fully utilized. Now, if you don't want to leave the euro, then clearly there ultimately has to be a supranational treasury, much like what you have in the United States, a federal government's treasury in the US, which, be able, which would be able to spend like a sovereign government does. That is something that is going to take a number of years to achieve, which is why Warren Mosler and I have proposed a stopgap measure, according to which the European Central Bank would create and distribute trillions in euros amongst member nations on a per capita basis. As we said earlier, this is not a bailout. Every country gets it on a per capita basis, which means that Germany gets the biggest amount of all. Each individual nation could retain control over spending. The key is that this provides time for the Eurozone nations to come up with a more permanent solution along the lines of creating a supranational treasury that would spend as much as 10 to 15 percent of Eurozone GDP. Because the European par Parliament's budget is currently under 1 percent of GDP. It's far too small to generate anywhere near the kind of level of aggregate demand that you need to have the economy grow again. Again, the actual spending decisions where the money goes could be made by individual member states with the distribution of spending determined by population. Now to reiterate the ECB distribution on a per capita basis, we might need something as much as 10 percent of Eurozone GDP per year to put the solvency issue uh, behind us along with relaxed budget rules. We might need, for example, to increase the limits on the stability and growth pack up to about 6 or 7 percent uh, annually. The number really should be in line with what is needed to sustain full employment rather than choose an arbitrary number, but it might take up to 6 percent. So rather than bringing your countries down to an arbitrary, predetermined target level which has no real economic logic, the rules should be relaxed to allow growth, which in turn will bring stability, once you have something closer to full employment. And again, as I said before, I'd probably look at suspending the VAT to both increase aggregate demand and lower prices. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.